All right, today we're going to be talking about different types of variables, mainly bound versus free variables, what is acceptable in a sentence in predicate logic, and what is not. Okay, so we have free and bound variables, and we say that a variable x is free if it does not occur in the scope of a quantifier. What this means is if we have all x, and following this, there's always going to be brackets that contain a bunch of things. And what it means is that this x is bound to the universal quantifier in here, and every occurrence of x on the inside is bound to that quantifier there. So if we have a sentence, all x, p, and then we have some and dx outside, well, this x here only binds things inside of these main brackets, which means that this x out here is free, because it is not being bound by this x. In fact, smart me, I put the word, the definition for bound after the word of free, so this will make more sentence after we talk about this. So a variable is bound if it occurs in the scope of a quantifier. So if we have there exists an x, and we have dx and px, and we have something after that, that is qx, which ones are bound? Well, these two x's are bound because they're in the scope of this quantifier e, because, or existence because these main brackets here for the x essential quantifier contain these x's. However, this x out here beside q is free because it is not contained within the brackets. So I'm going to show you one more thing that you can do. Let's say we want to have the sentence, all dogs are blue and all cats are gray. I'm not going to formalize these, but I'll use very obvious predicates. So we can say for all x, if x is a dog, then x is blue. And for all y, if y is a cat, then y is gray. Okay, so we have one object here that talks about dogs and the color blue, and we have one object y here that talks about cats and gray. What we can do is we can use, instead of y, we can use x again. And this talks now about a different object x. Now do you do this often? No. This isn't something that you would do for your own sanity but is perfectly acceptable because of the way that scope works. These x's here are only contained within this little universe here, this little quantificational universe that we have. So that x is completely separate from this x over here. It's just some dummy variable that gets properties from inside the bracket. That's it. Now normally you wouldn't write x in the second one, you would write y for your own sanity, but this is perfectly acceptable. Now let's move on to what a well-formed sentence looks like. And we say the sentence is well-formed if there is no occurrence of a free variable in a sentence. You see, we don't like free variables. They exist, but we don't like them. We like constants to be out there, not variables. So if we have there exists an x such that dx and gx, and outside we have some a with some property p, this is fine because there's no free variables. However, if we have there exists an x, and I'm only going to change one thing here, and we have some px, well, this is a problem because we recognize that this is a variable. So we say x is a variable, but our problem is, is that is it all 
Is it some? It's so, it's very descriptively vague. And because it's vague, we don't want it to be part of a well-formed sentence. Why would we want our logic to talk about something that we don't even know what it could possibly be talking about? We don't know what this is. We don't know where its bounds are. We don't know what it attaches to. Is it the same x? Is it a different x? What if we just have a sentence that's px and gx without a quantifier? How do we know that these two refer to the same thing when it's just a variable? We don't. That's why we require that these things be bound. So that way we know what it's referring to. And this will make a little bit more sense when you start doing your problems. Um, one thing I should note is that this first scenario is okay. And it's also completely okay to mix predicate logic and quantificational logic. So we can write something like this. There exists an x such that dx and px and some proposition are. That's okay, because it's just a proposition. We can have propositions in our logic. All right, so hopefully you understand why we don't want free variables occurring in our sentences. So let's move on to this part. What if there are quantifiers without their corresponding variables appearing in a sentence? Now, what do I mean here? I mean, what if we have there exists an x such that pa, and this is going to be a is Albert, and p x is going to be x is pretty. So this sentence in English just means Albert is pretty, but we've defined it that for some x, Albert is pretty. Now, is this okay? I want you to seriously answer this question on your own, so like, make up your mind right now, is this okay? If you said yes, okay, you're right, it is okay. Now, the question is, why is it okay? Because We, we have technically bound all the x's inside the bracket to that existential quantifier. It just happens that the amount of x's inside is zero. There are no free variables, therefore it's okay. Because our idea of a well-formed sentence isn't that there exist bound variables, but the fact that there does not exist any free variables. And there are no free variables. Therefore, it's okay. I should mention, however, if you just have this sentence, there exists p of x, this is entirely wrong because the existential and universal quantifiers require some variable after them and only one variable. Later, you can put multiple, but right now we just want one variable. So that right there is wrong. For our uh, last slide here, we're going to explain quantifiers a little bit more propositionally, if this makes sense. We're also going to talk about negation. So, if I say all x, px, what I really mean here is something along the lines of, well, yes, p1 has the property, and p2 has the property, and p3 has the property, all the way up to that last x having the property. So if all x px, then what we're saying is that every x in the universe has the property p. Now if we say there exists an x such that px, really what we're saying is that at least one of the x's in the world has that property. So it's basically a bunch of disjuncts. You know, it makes sense that there exists an x, that means at least one, and for all x, that just means all of them. So we have this conjunction and this disjunction to represent these truth functions. So when we negate something, let's say, if we say not all x, px, that means that 
not all x are px, so there's at least one thing that is not a p of x. We can write this as not p1 all the way up to pn using conjunction. And with De Morgan's law, we know this is the same thing as not p1 or not p2 or not p3, so on up to not pn. And using this definition of existential quantifiers, we know this is the same thing as saying there exists an x such that not px. So we've now proven this claim that if we have not all x px, this is equivalent to saying there exists an x such that not p of x. Now what happens if we have there does not exist an x such that p of x? Well, using the same reasoning here, we would get it is not the case that p1 or p2 or p3, so on, which means it is not the case that p1 and it is not the case that p2 all the way up to and it is not the case that pn, which is the same thing as saying for all x, not p of x. So we've also claimed and proven that not existential x, px, is the same thing as saying for all x, not px. So we've proven these little equivalencies with negations. Now the cool thing about this is there's actually a very easy way to remember this. I think this was the best proof I've ever got in a course for this stuff. And this was not even in a logic course. This was in a discrete mathematics course where I got this description. And this was the one thing that tied these equivalences all together for me. Since you're basically just taught that these are equivalent using some formal definition using language, using the English language, you are expected to intuitively understand that not all x px is the same thing as there exists an x that not px. Now, I yearn for some mathematical proofs, so I think this is very, very sufficient but a little trick to remember some stuff here. If we have all x, px, what we can do is we can define all x to be equal to not exists an x not, and exists an x is the same thing as not all x not. So, when we have all x px, this is going to be the same thing as saying not exists an x, not px. Because we just substitute in this all x for not exists not. So what this really is, think of this as kind of like a truth. So you have a truth all x, truth px. When we switch to make an equivalent statement, all we do is we change the pluses to minuses, the universals to existences, and we leave the predicate alone. So we have all x px becomes not exists in x such that not px. Now when we take a look at our equivalences last time, for not exists in x such that p of x, Let's just do some switching here. Plus all x, not px. Oh, look, it's exactly the same. So this is a cool little trick you can remember that the nots changes to positives, the positives to nots, and the existentials and universals switch. Um, if I were to give you some new operators and say, okay, we have this star p here, and I want you to write it in terms of this donut p, you can probably guess, oh, it's just going to follow the same thing, that star p is not donut not p. So this is a common operation done with existentials. In fact, you'll see it in modal logic if you have box p. It's the same thing as not diamond not p. And this is modal logic. I might cover it at some point if the demand is high, but that's a nice quick way of remembering things. I kind of did these last two slides uh, impromptu. Impromptu? 
I did them for fun, sort of as a extra add-on, because this stuff, uh, you're not going to find this in the logic book. Because for some reason, having these intuitive mathematical proofs of existential and universal quantifiers and their equivalents uh, aren't satisfactory for a intro of logic book, which doesn't make any sense. But anyways, I'm going off on a tangent. That was quantificational logic. Pretty soon we're going to start proofs, and those are tough. So if you don't get those, don't worry. I'm here to help.